We've experienced another tragedy, another mass shooting. And my gratitude and congratulations goes out to the law enforcement family in Annapolis that responded so quickly to the tragedy. And they um, estimated that it took them only a minute to get to the site to respond to the active shooter situation. And yet, even though with that quick response time, we still lost five human beings. So what can we do? What, what can we do now? What can we learn now? What can we incorporate now that reduces the human carnage? So I had a teacher who used to say to me, and what happened before that? So my instruction today, my Dhamma talk today is based on being able to recognize what happened before that. And we sometimes or we have identified law enforcement and other agencies that help in reconciling the, the event. We've called them the first responders. But I want to present to you today another idea or concept, and that is that the first responder is the one who responds to the thought that says this is a good idea to kill somebody. That's the first responder. The one who responds to the thought that suggests that harming or violating someone else's rights is the appropriate thing to do. And I think that I know that all of the wisdom paths, all of the paths of realization teach on and express the idea of consequences for actions. That if you do good, good happens. If you do bad, bad happens. And I think so, I think that it is our responsibility then as an agency of understanding actions or karma and the fruits of karma that we also emphasize double down on what we can do as individuals that will not allow us to get caught up in that loop of allowing suggestions of consciousness or mind to persuade us to do what we know is unwholesome and unbeneficial. So I'm going to work from two suttas today, two teachings today. The one is 114, and the title is To Be Cultivated and Not to Be Cultivated. And what it does, it takes us a little deeper in our understanding on how we are persuaded by suggestions of mind to do wholesome or unwholesome things? How do we incline the mind and the heart to do what we know is right and to abandon what we know is incorrect or assaulting to the senses of others and ourselves included? So it first of all guides us into a deeper understanding of what is involved and what is impacted. And it tells us that bodily conduct is of two kinds. That verbal conduct is of two kinds. That mental conduct is of two kinds. That the acquisition of perception is of two kinds. The acquisition of individuality is of two kinds. So it's really breaking down something for us to help us to understand how 
we are influenced by and how we are liberated by the understanding of that to not be persuaded to act unwholesomely in this world. And it says, mental conduct is of, mental conduct is of two kinds. To be cultivated and not to be cultivated. So what is to be cultivated? What is to be cultivated are the actions that produce wholesome actions, that produce wholesome states of mind, which produce wholesome actions. And what is not to be cultivated is the thoughts or mind that inclines us to act unwholesomely or produce unwholesome fruits of action. And so we have a pretty good idea of the flavors or persuasions that are unwholesome, that is, suggestions that killing or harming people is a good idea, or taking from people or stealing from people is a good idea, or being harsh or angry with people is a good idea. So we need to create that space between suggestion and doing so that we can have a space to intervene and correct inappropriate thinking that leads to inappropriate verbal action or inappropriate, inappropriate body action. We have to intervene in that space so that it will never be pronounced or projected out into reality or on others. And so how do we do that? How do we practice being present when the idea arises that harming another individual by actions, by bodily actions or by words is a good thing to do. And so the practice tells us to begin to watch the mind, to investigate the states of consciousness and to evaluate or observe their content to see whether it suggests something that is wholesome or ideal or beneficial or something that is unwholesome or unbeneficial and uh, therefore damaging to ourselves and to others. So it tells us, it gives us a mind training, a bhavana, a meditation that says, contemplate the mind objects, mind objects, thoughts, objects of mind, thoughts. It says, contemplate, observe, sit with, objects of mind, and to just simply categorize whether they are wholesome or unwholesome. So now, what is the filter then that they suggest that we hold up or we scrutinize these mind objects with? It says, use the five hindrances, the five hindrances to accomplishment in meditation and accomplishment in enlightenment or realization. Those five hindrances are sensual desire, ill will, doubt, sloth and torpor, and restlessness or worry. These are the concepts that you're using to evaluate the quality of thought that is present in your consciousness. And it says if you discover a mind object that you can 
associate with one of the hindrances, just note it. Just say, this is a thought of ill will, or this is a thought of sensual desire, or this is a thought of sloth and toper, or this is a thought of doubt. Just identify it. You can't do anything about what is already present and what is already born into this reality. But what you can do is to employ, if you decide that it is undesirable, you can employ an antidote to it so that you can incline your mind and incline your association with something that is more wholesome than what is present. So for instance, if you discover that in your stream of consciousness there is a thought of hate or ill will towards an individual or a group of individuals, it's not about struggling with that thought. It's not about embracing or rejecting or having aversion to that thought. It is about inclining the mind to a thought that is opposite to that. So, for instance, in the state of hating or having ill will towards somebody, wishing someone harm, you would begin to incline your mind towards loving or kindness or compassion. And therefore, by associating and connecting your attention to what is wholesome, what is kind and compassionate and loving toward another individual or another group, you abandon the association with the unwholesome state of consciousness that is present in the stream of consciousness, which is your mind. And you continue to work with that until your mind begins to automatically or unintentionally, without intention, incline toward the thought of kindness and love and not produce the energy and the inclination to think about harming or being violent or hating somebody. So. You have it? It makes sense? Okay, so remember again, we are the first responses, responders. We respond to the information embedded in the conscious stream of our mind. We either flow with it or we reject it. But most often we just accept it. We, well, I hate that guy because of what he did. Or I wish that group harm because of what they did. And the instructions are that associating with and embracing what is harmful will produce a fruit that is damaging to ourselves or damaging to others. And this is the what we would call bad karma or the fruits of bad karma, which would be the consequences of our actions. All of the past teach us about consequences. Now we have a procedure by which to influence our actions, which will produce the consequences which we feel we deserve and what we will benefit from. That's the schematic, that's the schema. And that's the way we alter the way our world is perceived and the way the world is manifested. One mind, one individual at a time, deciding 
to do what is wholesome and to abandoning the abandoning of what is unwholesome. That's all it is to it. Okay. So if there are no questions, we'll go into the technique. We'll go into the meditation itself. Yes. So as I'm thinking about the shift from unwholesome to wholesome, Mm -hmm. if I were a person that arrived at a scene, um, like this last um, massacre that was happening, it's difficult for me to see how I could intervene as a first responder without physically stopping that person. Okay. Because there would be more deaths as a result. So that's, that's kind of where I'm in the place of, you know, how do I intervene in a wholesome way to a high level emergency dangerous situation like that? Okay. That's a legitimate question. So let's, let's take it to something that we can understand. You're driving down the highway and you see someone has plowed into a tree and they're hanging halfway out their car. Right? So the same desire arises in us. Let me help. Let me, let me be of service. Let me be beneficial. But we're also governed by and restricted by the fact that I don't know the first thing about first aid, right? So in that picture, we do what it is that we can do. We might call, call someone who does know, you know, 911, but we don't insert ourselves and get, in, get busy in the mix because we already realize we're not qualified. So you take that same understanding with you in all situations. If I'm qualified to be a part of the scene without harming anything, without harming anybody, then I will participate. But if I'm not qualified, then I won't participate. I'll do what I can do, but I won't put produce any more harm than I can. Yes, Panyawani. Some of this has to do with changing the conditioning that we have uh, depending on the kind of life that we have lived. For instance, that day uh, when those first responders arrived, uh, at, they somehow managed to exercise uh, right-mindedness and they were able to apprehend him, although he had killed five people in two minutes. That same day or the day before, uh, there was a, a, a traffic stop and a 13-year-old black kid went running and the police officer shot him in the back and then somehow he flipped around and shot him in the face. And so one was they were able to apprehend a killer, you know, through right-mindedness and another was just shot a, a, a kid running in the back. So, so we're making judgments all the time about what seems to be a right action or or, or uh, based on how we think and perceive things, people, and and the world. So part of this is about changing your mind that it's all right for a routine traffic stop and you don't know whether anybody's done anything or not to shoot them in the back versus do all you can to apprehend someone else even though they've killed five people. It's the way we think about people, you know, and it's the way we think about situations. And we, and that's based on how we've always thought about certain people and certain situations. So in order for the world to come to some place of respect, you know, the Buddha is simply saying, whatever you don't want done to you or yours, don't do that to others. Don't take the most extreme as your first line of defense or offense. Uh, you know, and until the world each person one by one starts to make that discrimination, then we're going to have the kind of horrors that we have in the world. But the, but until, if each one does not make the change, the horrors will remain. 
The only way the hearts go away is that each one also has to change. And so although we speak of the world, we speak of the country, we speak of, you know, but it's not that. We are the world. We are the country, each one of us individually. So it takes personal practice, personal discipline, personal changing of mind for the country to work, to change, for the world to change. And so although we might have to come together and do things as a group to help bring about focus and attention, but focus and attention is not change. Each individual has to, has to have his own mind uh, reconditioned. And that's what the practice, our practice is. Thank you. I was going to say that for another Dharma talk. <laughs> I was going to slowly introduce you into the communal water. But yeah, that too. That too. Uh, it's incumbent on all of us to decide whether we're qualified to step into any situation and not do the harm, not do any more harm than, than it's already been done. And that, that goes across the board to everybody. You know, in other words, if I'm a law enforcement officer and the only thing I know how to do is shoot you, then I'm not a very good law enforcement officer. I have to have other tools in my belt other ways to lower the, the energy of, of, of violence without necessarily shooting. So it takes cultivation. This is what we're talking about. What it is that we can use to cultivate our minds to, do the, to bring about the best possible results for everybody. Okay? Anyone else? All right. So, contemplation of mind objects or investigation of states. So the first thing we do is to put away covetousness and grief for the world. So if we have any greed or desire for the world or any sorrow or grief for the world, we lay that aside as we go into our meditation and our observation of our own mental continuum, our own mind stream. We don't have any desire to see one thing or the other. We just want to see what's there. We want to see the truth of our consciousness, what it is that we can, we carry around with us every moment of our existence. So. Going inside without covetousness or grief, without wanting anything or pushing anything away, and seeing what's present in our mental continuum.
what I hope that one day everyone in the world will agree to and practice is there's no such thing as a righteous shoot or a justifiable homicide. That or a holy war. Just no such thing. The violence stops because everyone agrees to stop the violence that is issued from within themselves. I know it looks complicated, looks crazy, looks undoable, but one of the mind states that I see that promotes that and disagrees with the necessity for violence and hatred is a conscientious objector. They inserted themselves in the midst of the most horrific violence, which is war. And they promised that they would do their best to help who they could help without harming anybody or anything. Now, unfortunately, there are no slats parallel to that in law enforcement. But maybe we will evolve into the kind of civilization that will encourage those sorts of being in law enforcement, where you don't have to carry a weapon with you as you go out and do what you do. That you start out your morning with a promise of promoting peace and goodwill and love in everything that you do, that you don't feel that there is a moment that justifies resorting to violence to handle the issue. That you are spiritual enough, wise enough to present a solution without having to draw a gun or draw a club or draw tasers. Now, the paths, the paths of realization suggest that that possibility is attainable. It doesn't say don't kill unless. It says don't kill. There's no wiggle room. And as long as you allow for wiggle room, then people will feel that that is a necessary provision for their participation in relationship. That if you do this, I can do this. I have license to do this. But the wisdom paths the path of realization, say, under no circumstances are you justified in hating, in killing, in stealing, in raping. Under no circumstances is that acceptable. Now, that's a hard, that's a hard bar to rise up to, no doubt about it. But I'd rather keep the bar where it is than the Lord and say, okay, well, you can do this and you can do that. I'd rather have the bar up here so that we don't make any mistakes and that we don't accept for ourselves less than we should accept for ourselves. We are so far, our potential is so far beyond the way we live. So let's keep the bar up here and let's levitate.